Great. Okay, we are set. So my name is Mike Rasika. Uh, I founded Note Conference about 12 years ago, and um, we invest in non-performing mortgages. Uh, what I'm going to cover in depth today and in our next video too is the actual process of investing in non-performing notes, the way Note Conference does it, the way we teach it. Uh, we are going to be covering, um, I, I believe we're going to do this video series, uh, probably uh, three videos in a row. And uh, looking forward to really getting, i got nothing else to do, um, really getting in depth with how we run our note business. And um, looking forward to share that with you folks here. So we came up with the title Recession Proof Business. And uh, it's, it's so funny because we were, we were on the phone with uh, our bankruptcy attorney as a creditor uh, down in Florida a couple of days ago. And I'm like, how's it going for you? Are you guys slowed down or, or, um, or what? He's like, slow down. I'm in a recession proof business. I'm a bankruptcy attorney. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess your business would increase. And then we hung up the phone and my wife and I looked at each other and I'm like, I guess we're kind of in a recession proof business too. Meaning when things get bad, things get good. And that's what I want to share with you today. Uh, so let me uh, kick off our slideshow here. So if you haven't already done so, you can go to www.noteconference.com. And what that'll do is actually, uh, you'll see a place there to put your first name and email address in there. And I, I have a ongoing um, newsletter, I guess you could say. It's, it's just whenever I, I come across some great content that I wanna share out with my network, um, by going to noteconference.com and joining our mailing list, I consider you then part of my network. And um, any questions that you have, e just email them to mike at noteconference.com. Uh, we just had someone the other day who was looking for a foreclosure attorney, I think it was in Colorado. And he emailed me and he's like, hey, listen, is, do you have any recommendations? I don't just want a list of attorneys. I want an actual recommendation. And this, uh, I was able to answer him quickly. And so off he goes, starting his foreclosure process. Because of our little network, someone replied back and said, yep, I've used this attorney. They're great, good people, great price, uh, great process. And so that's the network that we've built. Any type of questions that you have regarding anything. It's not legal advice and, and this whole webinar is not legal advice or accounting advice or anything, but we will get you answered. We'll get your questions answered. If I don't have the answer, I'll find somebody in my network that does have the answer. So what am I going to cover today? First of all, that's me with my mustache. Uh, that's gone. I got rid of that uh, the first day of lockdown. I'm like, you know what? I keep touching and twirling my mustache, you know? <laughs> and so I got rid of that. Um, all right. So, so with the note business, when, when I first started this business out, I was working, I, I quit my job two years prior and I, my whole life revolved around real estate. I ended up getting my real estate license. I owned at the time, I think we had three or four rentals, um, two, two families and, and maybe three single families at that time. And we started flipping houses back in 2005. We started, uh, had, I think at one point we had like seven of them going at once. So my whole life revolved around real estate and that's who I was. I, I had a very small network of, of people that I hung out with. I, I literally went to RIA meetings with two other friends of mine and that was just, that was it. 
And then I found out about this new business. The mentor that I found for myself had started a group call and the people that I was able to meet on this group call were amazing. Um, I never thought I would ever have contact with the level of people that were on that call. Meaning these were, these were successful people that were doctors and lawyers and um, investors that were just doing other types of investments. Um, and they, everybody on that call realized how powerful the note business was. And I realized, you know what? I want to be the note guy. And so who did I need to become to be that note guy? I literally had to change everything about myself. I, I had to believe in myself that I could actually be the person that is a successful investor. I also needed to believe that I could be the person that could actually be a leader in this industry. And that was far from where I, what I believed at the time. Um, I had hired another mentor who I ended up uh, with a one-on-one -on -one coaching call, a pretty expensive coaching call uh, with him uh, way back then. And he said, so who, who do you, who do you want to be? Who do you need to become? I said, well, I want to be the note guy. And he said, well, that's easy. So you're not going to think about all the mechanical things that you need to do. Like, you need to be talking to people. You need to be all of the, all of the moving parts. You need to get capital. You need to do due diligence. Forget all about that. He said, so what is your business? And I told him about the business and he said, how many of these notes do you need for you to feel like you're the note guy? I said, probably 50 would make me feel like I'm, I'm getting a good immersion. And he said, I want you, now this is, this is at the end of 2008. And he said, I want you to picture yourself celebrating the closing or the purchase of those 50 notes with your family, whether it's beer or wine, whatever you're going to be drinking, there's a big toast that you made it. And I want you to feel that feeling right now, just sitting right in the chair. What does that feel like? I said, it. It's fantastic. It doesn't seem real. He said, you keep practicing that and it will become real and you will become the note guy. Well, in February of 2009, I closed my first note brokering deal with 54 notes and with five other guys, a couple of those guys are on this call. And that's how I realized that I could actually become another person. I could become someone that was totally just not feeling comfortable um, at that time. As I practiced that, I, I literally became another person and you can too. I, I know that you can because the, the ability that I had to envision myself, everybody has, has the same ability. And, uh, and that's important. They, these are in very important times that we're going through right now. And I'm looking at this as an opportunity to become the next best version of myself. Uh, as corny as it sounds, I could care less about how it sounds anymore. I know that it's possible to become a higher level of myself. I believe that everyone has that ability prior to, to me learning that I could actually change myself. Life just came at me. I took what came at me. I didn't have the notion that I could just become a different person. And um, now I intentionally do things knowing how it's going to play out. I, and I'll, I'll get in more into that as, as we go along, but uh, 
just literally take this time that we have right now, this nice time of pause, to think about who it is you need to become so that when we all get back on track, we will hit the ground running and being that new version of yourself. All right. So this is how I look at it. For, for the people that are not already in the note business, I know that I've got some experienced note investors on here, and I'm assuming that some people are not note investors yet. You can literally start a business now from day one of what I call this new segment of life that we're going through. We're going through a lot of change all at once. We, our country is going through change all at once. Uh, our neighbors <laughs> are going through change all at once. Uh, our, our, way of, our way of doing business has changed. And so do you believe that you can actually start a business right now from day one and just start living in that business. So let me dig into start with this note business, the stuff that we've been doing for a long time now. Um, probably the most important part of this business is the due diligence portion of this business. The due diligence process of actually evaluating a non-performing note will determine your success with that note going forward. So what, what is the, the due diligence process? So we've been working with the bank now for four years. The process is they send over, they, they were actually faxing over a PDF. We, we've been working with them for a while now. And in the beginning, they were faxing over what they call the deal sheet and in the deal sheet, I would get the property address, the borrower's name, the amount of debt that was owed, what they thought. Now, these are, these are non-performing second mortgages. Second mortgages, that's actually what I teach. We would get what they thought the first mortgage balance was, and that was uh, and a monthly payment of the loan that they were selling us. That was it. And now it's up to us to derive all of the other information for us to make an accurate decision on what it is we're buying and how much we're willing to offer to buy that loan. So first process, we look at Zillow. Um, I have the ability to run um, 999 Zillow pulls from a spreadsheet automatically. And so I'll cut and paste the addresses of these loans into my automated Zillow um, scraper and hit run. I go do something else. I come back five minutes later and all, however many loans I had it is completed. I cut and paste that back into my spreadsheet. Um, I get the Zestimate. I get the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the last sold date, the last sold price, and the actual Zillow link that I can, a live link that I can click on that later in my due diligence spreadsheet. So first thing I do is I get a value of the house. I then compare the value of that house with the amount that they think the first mortgage is, and I determine if there's any equity protecting the note that I'm actually buying. We buy notes that do have equity, protecting our position and we buy notes that do not have equity protecting our position. Meaning the first mortgage is higher than the value of the house and our second mortgage is hanging out there in the breeze. That's okay. Uh, the next thing we do, if we, we look at the location, we look at it, is it a state that we like buying? Is, a state, is it a, in a state that we do not, that does not require licensing? Uh, if it is, we will just pass on, there's um, three states now that we actually need licensing on, or there's some other um, limiting 
factors that we have to pay attention to, I'll just pass on those loans. Uh, the next thing we look at, if we like the state that it's in and we like the amount of equity or no equity involved, uh, really doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. I'll get into that later. Uh, we will pull a credit report. Uh, in that credit report, we determine a lot of things. We determine, we determine the ability or the inability for the borrower to make payments to us in the future. Uh, that's what that's what our goal is. We're we're looking for long-term monthly income, passive monthly income. And if we see that this borrower just does not pay anything, doesn't make car payments, doesn't make credit card payments, doesn't pay their child support, doesn't pay their alimony, that shows up on the, on the credit reports. And we will just avoid those loans. There's no reason to, for us to make that, that offer, make, to even make an offer on that loan. We'll just pass on that loan, put a line through it on a spreadsheet or erase it and uh, move on to the next one. We also derive on a credit report, possibly the balance of the first mortgage and the monthly payment of that first mortgage. That's all usually listed. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. We'll get into that when we cover bankruptcy. And so we can look at the first mortgage to say, yes, the, the uh, the seller that is selling these loans was accurate or is inaccurate with the balance of that first mortgage. We can look at if the borrower is just about to finish paying off their $600 a month car payment, we may be able to get a hold of that $600 a month if we can get in touch with the borrower within the, the time frame before that car payment uh, expires. Now, now the reason for that, the reason I even bother bringing that up, if a borrower is making a $600 a month car payment and then they finally pay that car off, let's say it's a seven year loan, what do they do? They go out and take out another car payment and go buy another car because they can afford it. So it's our job to say, listen, keep driving the car that you're in and start sending that partial part of that payment to us for your mortgage payment because we are a secured loan and we do have the right to foreclose. We determine that in credit report. We can see that, hey, they have uh, $12,000 available credit on a chase card. We can possibly uh, negotiate that amount of money down as well. So there's a ton of information that comes off of a credit report. It's kind of our lifeblood for the due diligence process. And some, and we, of course, get a FICO score. So if there is a, a great FICO score on a borrower, maybe it's a 740 or 750 or something, they may qualify for a refinance. Now, things are gonna change a little bit with this COVID situation as far as some of our exit strategies, but we feel that the changes that are gonna take place are gonna be minimal for our recession-proof business because the amount, the amount of distress that we've been working with for the last 13 years, um, remember I was doing this business through 2008, 9, 10, 11, where there was no available credit. I mean, credit was just, just it wasn't even funny. Uh, there was, there was, and I'm sure that everyone has lived through this, whether you're paying attention or not. That there is just, there was just nothing available back in the day, and um, so refinance was not a, a potential exit strategy back then, and I think it might be harder. I don't know. It depends on how this government decides to open up. But um, maybe credit will still be available uh, if the government forces the banks to make loans. But despite the fact, we will inevitably still have the non-performing note business. Now, 
if things get so bad that we do not have a, a recession proof business anymore, there's a whole lot more world of hurt going on besides um, just not having a business. I, I think that I, I saw, I saw today that Lebanon is, is rioting in the streets um, because they, they're running on the banks. If we get to that point, there's no business except for maybe ammunition uh, that's going to be um, a business that's going to be viable. But uh, we'll, we'll save that for another day. Um, so we believe that the note business is here and is here to stay. And um, the due diligence process will not change. Whether or not things do change in this country, we think that we're still going to have a pretty good handle on on um, how it is that we do do, uh, do our due diligence to ultimately derive an offer uh, price on the loans that we're trying to purchase. So the next thing that due diligence is going to tell us is, and this is from experience, and, and this is something that can be taught, is how much of the unpaid principal balance that we are purchasing, the UPB, how much of that $65,000 do we think is recoverable? Now this is where equity comes into play. Like I said, experience comes into play. We can teach you this part of the business as well, is to say, all right, of that $60,000 with an unpaid principal balance, how much of that is recoverable? Well. And how long will it take to get our hands on that money back? So that's where we sit down and say, well, we're looking at the credit score. We've got a pretty high FICO score. We think that, uh, let's say, a refinance is, is a potential. Um, there's $40,000 of equity protecting our position of that $60,000 that's owed to us. And we feel that we can recover easily $25,000 over the next year. So of that $25,000 of recoverable income that we think is gonna come into our company, how much do we have to, how much do you think we can buy this loan for? That's how I always, always, always come up with an offer price on a loan, is how much is recoverable and how long will it take? That's really very simple to come up with that. That's exactly how my mentor was selling us notes back on day one. He would look at the note, he would evaluate it, and he would he would say, you know what, I'm gonna give our students the potential of making a 50% return. That's how he backed into his prices, and it was brilliant. Because he would look at it and say, I think $25,000 is recoverable, so he would sell us that loan for $37,000, and we would make 12,000 bucks. And uh, I don't know if that comes out to 50% return, uh, but or, or maybe it was a, um, whatever the numbers come out to. So he would back it in that way, recoverable, 50% return. And he used to bang his shoe on the table. A 50% return is a good return. And it's a fantastic return. But if I'm looking at a $25,000 potential recoverable on that $60,000 loan, I'm probably gonna come in at about 15% of the purchase price. So of the unpaid principal balance, I'm sorry. So 15% of $16,000 is gonna be 9,000 bucks. And now if I take $9,000 and I think I have the potential to take that nine and turn it into 25, that's higher than a 50% return. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And that's my offer. And sometimes I do adjust my offer if the bank comes back and counter offers me. They say, well, what, can, you, can you hit 13? I'm like, I, I, can, I can go to 11.5, how about that? And you know, settle somewhere in the middle. Um, but that, really comes down to your due diligence on the person that you're buying the loan from. 
And that's a whole nother set of due diligence that, that we cover, that I can cover later on as well. Uh, so that's essentially the due diligence process. We also, we also um, take out or um, download a copy of a, a, a TLO report. Now the TLO report, I, I think it stands for TransUnion or something. Um, on the TLO report, I can pull down a TLO personal report. I can quickly glance at that and see if there are any other outstanding liens on the property. Uh, sometimes a credit report will give us some, some outstanding liens as well. A lot of times those liens are behind us, um, but that, that needs to be determined when we pull a title report. Now we don't pull a title report right away. They're too expensive. Um, so we just don't go down that road, but we do pull a TLO property report and a TLO personal report. Personal report gives us um, a whole bunch of phone numbers that are potential phone numbers for that borrower. Uh, it tells us that yes, the borrower does actually live in that, in that um, address, uh, how long they've lived there to see if that matches up with the information that Zillow gave us. Now the Zillow information, the last sold, uh, this estimate is, is easy enough. We all know what his estimate is. Now we pull the average of the values that his estimate goes out and scrapes. No, we don't pull the highest or the lowest, we pull the average. Um, the number of beds, number of baths, that speaks for itself, whether or not we're buying a, a little shack or this is a legitimate four bed, two bath house. And the most important thing that we are getting from our Zillow scrub is the last sold date. So why is that so important? If, the, if we see that the property has sold prior to or, or after, let's say 2009, then we know that the loan that we're buying is probably, uh, the house is probably, um, the loan that we bought is probably wiped out through a foreclosure or the person that we bought the buying these loans from actually got paid off and now they're selling us a bad loan. Meaning if the house sold, houses can't sell without title report getting cleared. So if there was a second mortgage on that house and then the house sells, that mortgage must have been negotiated one way or another. Either the seller sold it or the first foreclosed and the property sold at auction. And either way, we know that the loan that we're looking at is probably a dead loan. We could go ahead then at that point and either just dismiss that loan or we can go to county records and look to see if there is a new deed written on that house. Um, and so we would either inform the seller that, hey, that's a bad loan. There's nothing for us to see there, uh, nothing for us to buy there, and just move on to the next loan, or we just leave it alone, let the seller do what they do, and it's none of our business. Um, the last sold price um, does give us an indication that it does, it's not 100%, but it, the last sold price on a, on a Zillow, um, scrub that we pull tells us, it gives us a good idea of probably how much the purchase price loan, a purchase money loan was for the first mortgage. So then we can kind of back in those numbers to say, all right, so how much was the down payment? This was the first mortgage. Does that kind of line up with what the seller is telling us? And then we compare that information to what we find on the TLO property report, because that will give us sometimes the originating loans on down the line. So if the house sold, the last sold date on that house was 2006, we can go back to TLO and say, okay, what happened in 2006? Well, the house did transfer. There was a $180,000 Bank of America loan taken out. So that means we probably got 
uh, I don't know, at least a 10% down payment back in the day in 2006 when things were rocking and rolling. Um, how much should that first mortgage be now? We can kind of fiddle around and back in and out of those numbers to see um, where we think the first mortgage might be if we can't determine that information. Um, sometimes the credit report does not give us first mortgage information and the seller has no idea what the first mortgage is either because they're deriving this information the same way that I am or that we are. So we kind of squint and get a blurry idea of, and then whatever my offer is, let's say I was gonna offer 15 cents on this deal, I would offer them half of that, seven cents or six cents, because we're, we're going into unknown territory. Uh, we're, buying, we're buying a loan where we may, they may be two weeks from getting foreclosed by their first mortgage, so it, we're taking a bigger risk, and the risk that we're taking is we're not willing to put much money on the table to absorb that risk. Um, we'll risk a few pennies on a dollar, but not a whole bunch of money. So that's how I back into pricing on a note. Um, it's, 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 it's been perfecting. I've been perfecting this for 13 years now. Um, it's, it's gotten to the point where I can pretty much look at it alone and say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to hit a home run with this thing. Um, this borrower's solid. This house is in a great location. Um, the economy was booming. <laughs> um, so we, we, there's a lot of, we take a lot of risk out of the non-performing junior lien space because we have such, we have so much data of, of how things um, play out up until, up until this virus anyway. Um, we have so much data that we can draw from to conclude how this is gonna play out. We can conclude how much of that unpaid principal balance is recoverable. We can get a, a real good idea of how much money we're gonna make on these things. And that all comes from this due diligence process. So let's talk about sourcing product. Um, sourcing product has been, for me, probably, uh, almost 50% of my income that comes in from the note business. I told you in the beginning of this um, webinar that I wanted to become the note guy. I did my first trade. We bought 54 loans. Um, funny thing is I didn't make a dime with that trade. Um, I didn't know that I could. I wasn't trying to make money with that trade. I was trying to get 10 loans for myself and I was trying to get the other 44 for my friends. And so I became quite the hero by pulling down these 54 loans and letting my friends pick and choose which loans they were gonna buy. And at the end of the whole exercise, I think it took about, a, about three weeks, I think, to, to really do all our due diligence on that product and put a thing together and we came up with 350,000 bucks and we, we bought those loans. At the end, my friend goes, uh, that was really cool, Mike. You know, that we really appreciate this. And next time you should probably think about making money doing this. I'm like, making money? I, I'm just happy to get these loans. And um, he said, no, you, you, there's a value here and we're willing to pay you to continue to do what you do. Now this company now, that guy, he was a newbie and I was a newbie. Um, I don't know how big, what kind of a half a billion dollar hedge fund that he runs right now in the note business. From the same information that we were taught in our group call and the same information that I'm passing out through our, our fast track business, um, except 
that him and I now have 13 live years of experience to add on to the information that we derived through our mentorship program that we took when we were newbies. Um, 13 years of, uh, you know, grinding these notes out. And, um, but sourcing, sourcing notes is a big part of my income. At, in the very beginning, what I was doing was I was taking 2% of the unpaid principal balance as my fee. So it was really easy to calculate. If you were buying a loan from me at 18 cents, I'm buying it from them at 16 cents. So I would just add two cents on for myself. You would give me 18 cents. I would send out 16 cents and I would keep two cents for myself. And it's a funny story because I was sourcing product for some some of my my good friends and one day one of the guys comes up to me and he goes Rasika I finally figured out what that two cents means I sat down and I calculated all the loans that I purchased off of you over the last three years and the amount of money I think you could have put both of your kids through college with that two cents <laughs> and I and I thanked him for it and uh, he made a ton of money off of those loans and so we, we still kid around about that. Uh, two cents, what's two cents? Well, I, I've come to actually change my tune now because a lot of the $20,000 notes that I was selling, uh, $20,000 note, two cents is 400 bucks as a commission. Now it's just as much work to sell a $20,000 loan as it is to sell a $200,000 loan. So I said, you know what? I'm just gonna make it a flat fee, minimum 2,000 bucks per file, per folder. And it's been that way ever since, um, 2000. Now, sometimes there are opportunities where I can get a little bit more than 2000 bucks per file, where I think that there's more meat on the bone. Um, with some deals, I, I maybe can squeeze out three or 4,000 bucks and the, the seller is still happy. I mean, the buyer is still happy to work with me and um, things work out real well when you're selling 20 files at 2000 bucks and it, it's not a whole heck of a lot of work. So sourcing products has been a fantastic um, thing for me and we do teach sourcing in the fast track business as well. Uh, like I said, it's almost 50% of my income and I think going forward in this environment, it may be, be more than 50% now. Um, Meaning, I don't know how much, um, I'm, I believe that we're going to see a lot more product over the next six months. Um, now, the product that I think we're going to see is going to be from hedge funds that are holding notes at this moment. I've already seen an increase uh, from one of the servicing companies that's been sending me product. So you, let's, let's just look at a servicing company for a moment. So a servicer, when I, let's say I buy five loans, I bring these loans to the servicer and I say, hey, please get these things performing. Start working these loans. And they will do their due diligence process now. They'll go through every page in the collateral file. They'll put that loan into their system they will see all the phone numbers that I've derived from the TLO report. They'll put those phone numbers into their system. They will do all the accounting to get that loan into the system as well. And then they start contacting the borrower. And so they've got my five loans and they, maybe they've got a thousand other people uh, that have five loans in their system as well. So pandemic rolls around and people are like, you know what? I'm sick of paying my servicing fees on loans that are non-performing. So I tell you what, Mr. Servicer, you know a thousand other people that are note investors. Why don't you go ahead and sell those loans to, to one of them or to some of them? And so obviously they have a thousand of their clients' email addresses 
and they blast out to the clients and say, hey, uh, Joe Schmo over here is, is done with the note business. He's done with the non-performing part of it. Uh, he's got five assets that he wants to sell. That's the first place we're going to start seeing assets coming in. Um, they're going to, people are, are just, they need the money. They either, they don't want to shell out any more money or they want that 50 grand that they can raise from selling those five notes. Even if they sell them at a loss, they still are getting 50 grand. So it's our job to be there to pick up the pieces. And that's where our short term product is going to come from within the next three weeks, month, two months, three months. Now, when those five loans go out to those thousand other clients, that is where we go back where this part comes in again. So now those five loans go out, you're right back at page one, performing your due diligence on those five loans. And now you're taking our current situation that we are in with this COVID-19 and saying, what's recoverable? Oh, so now we've got a whole different set of factors coming in now because we're bringing, introducing the COVID post cove, I guess you could call it, um, playing into how much is recoverable. So there's a whole nother, this is a whole nother animal now. We've got a borrower who has gone through the, and, and they're in this post cove environment where they're afraid to go out, they're afraid to go to work, they're afraid to bring this disease home, uh, introduce it to their family, I mean, we're coming into some weird times, but the pricing of this one individual who needs, who, who wants this $50,000 to buy those five loans, it might not happen. It might not be five fifty thousand dollars It might be $22,000 or $18,000 because it's a different environment now. And these are important factors to be bringing into your, your quiver of arrows now that we are, are introducing a whole new level of uh, events, I guess you could say, and, and circumstances into that loan purchase. So yeah, the seller may want $50,000, but it might not happen. So that's, that's where we're going to be factoring in the haircut that people are gonna be taking because if I've got $50,000 of dry powder that I can buy those five loans, but I'm waiting for really good deals, I want, exceptional deals and and this seller is stuck on his fifty thousand dollar number i'm just going to pass because we've only got so much dry powder and if if i feel this way i think that most of my other investor friends those other thousand people that are clients of the servicer are going to feel that way too so what does that do that drives down the market it just it, it's just supply and demand and if people are holding on tighter to their capital, they're not gonna be making the purchases that they would have made pre-COVID, pre-virus. And so I just wanna bring that to you as well, that there are going to be a lot more product available uh, short term in the next two to three months for a lot of reasons. Um, some of the smaller and medium and large hedge funds, I believe in some situations have paid too much for their product during the last five years. Uh, I know that firsthand because I have lost a lot of bids uh, to other bidders and I was able to find out what was, what finally got paid, what was actually paid for the loans that I was looking at I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you kidding me? People are, people got to deploy their investors money. We can't sit on money for six months waiting for the perfect deal to come around. They're raising capital first 
and then going out and buying loans. And I think we're going to see some blood in the streets on, on some uh, of, of these funds that were started up where everybody's preaching the price of notes has gone up and too bad. That's the way it is. And like, I'll just wait it out and I'll wait it out for today for exactly what is going to happen today. There are people at this moment contemplating how they are going to pay their investors next week uh, at month end. And so that is going to be a determining factor. Every month that we get deeper into this, there's going to be more bloodshed. And that means that the price of notes has just gone down. And so that is a fantastic situation for us to be in. Um, so sourcing product, that's, that's back where I was before. Um, yeah, I'm all messed up here. Let's start with this. So by learning the note business and by, by seeing what is going on out in the real world today with uh, schools transferring over to a Zoom call, which is fantastic. Um, colleges are switching over to Zoom calls, fantastic. It's a tragedy that these kids are gonna graduate not too long from now, are gonna have to do that virtually as well. It's also a tragedy that when they graduate, they're not gonna be going out into the business world because I don't think there's gonna be much of a business world for a while. Um, office, commercial office space, I think is gonna be dead for a while, maybe forever. Um, but for us, it's business as usual. Uh, the only thing that, that has affected us so far was we were planning on, on going to Puerto Rico and hanging out and doing the business from there. That's not gonna happen um, anytime soon. I wish we were stranded there. Um, I could be doing this webinar from anywhere. We could be doing our, our calls to uh, our, our bankruptcy attorney from anywhere. <laughs> um, nothing really has changed other than grocery shopping. So it's been business as usual for us. We've, we do this business from anywhere. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing. If you don't have your own business, this is the time to think about starting your own business. Uh, I feel, and I have felt for the last 13 years now that the note business is the most profitable, lucrative, easy business to run. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I've talked with many other investors that are alongside me and they've come to the same conclusion. If you're not in business for yourself right now, this is the time to start. So um, let's see, where am I here? Building your own network. So building your network. I know that I've got my network. My network has been in place for 12 years now. Build your own network so that when you're sourcing product, you got somebody to sell to. You don't want to sell it to my people. If you do, fine, I'll take a cut from you. But get your own people. Get your own network. Start your network today. Start talking to people. Start joining Facebook groups. Join the Facebook group, make some friends, and then get the hell off of Facebook and get, the, get those people into your network, meaning start communicating with them. Start your own newsletter. You know, we, in the very beginning of this, webinar, I talked about joining my, my newsletter and it's a, it's a real thing. I, my newsletter bring attracts, I think I've got 930 people as of today that have gone into my email account and I am able to communicate with them. Now that's me communicating with them. And then if they want to respond back to me, they just hit reply and it comes back to me but they don't get to talk to the other 929 people. That's what Facebook does. It allows those 929 people to talk to each other. That's not your network. That's Facebook's network. 
and that's everybody else's 930 people. So you have to start your own network. You have to be the hub in the center of the wheel of all the spokes that are going out. And if you're the hub, that's your network. And Facebook is a great place to get introduced. LinkedIn is a great place to get introduced. Um, and I know that this goes against my son's philosophy of if you're on Facebook, keep your contact in Facebook. Um, that's true to an extent, but I like to pull people from Facebook and put them into my personal network. Um, I think it's, it's more intimate that way. Uh, I think that um, people sometimes enjoy the emails that I write. Maybe it gets them a little pissed off. Um, I don't get too many unsubscribes. Um, I've actually, <laughs> when I hit a thousand a couple of years ago, my price jumped on my email subscription um, software. So I sent an email out and I said, please unsubscribe. And uh, I, only, I got a very small response. It was, it was pretty comical. Um, I've never gotten an email, please unsubscribe. <laughs> so um, have fun with it, build your, but build out your own network. And um, I, I know for, for me, it is the biggest part of my business is my network. I, I would not have been able to sell those first 54 notes if it wasn't for the, the five other people that were, that was the size of my network at the time, 2008, uh, beginning of 2009, it, the, that's how big my network was. And I was able to close a $350,000 deal. And then I go on with those same five people to take down so many other trades where I started making money on, on my uh, sourcing. So, Build out your own network, and um, we talked about that. This is the coolest, all right? The only way to predict the future is to create it. So what does that mean? It means where do you picture yourself three months from now? Meaning, how do you picture the future you three months from now? Well, I predict, I predict that I will close on 50 notes and I will have $200,000 in the bank account. Okay, so how in the world is that gonna happen? Well, you have to work towards that now. Once you set a goal, things will start to happen. Things will start to appear and, and manifest in your life when you predict your future and then you start to create it. It's very easy to do folks. And um, I, I got to say, you know, this one, this one is, this is on you. Um, your discipline during this time of, of, of choosing really what you're going to do with this, with this pause. Now, some of you may still be at work. Some of you may be healthcare providers and working your tails off and we appreciate and and honor you for that. Uh, I know that there were several people that wanted to get on this call, but they're too busy. Um, we did record this thing. You can go back and listen to it if you want. But it is on you and what you do with your time and how you, how you spend your time, um, whether you're investing in yourself or you're reading or you're partnering with other people or whatever, it really is on you. And um, so I just want to close this up uh, today. I know that we've been on here for an hour. Um, this is my website, noteconference.com. Put your name and email address in there. Uh, that would be great. I will continue my deep dive into our note business on the next call. Uh, I've got a ton of stuff to cover between bankruptcy and uh, a lot of choices of what states to work with, what states not to work with. Probably the biggest thing that I will put into the webinar for next week is going to be how I work 
with people that sell me notes. Uh, some real inside information that I've gathered over the years on why people sell notes and how to get the best price. I think this is going to be the most important module for next week. Uh, make sure that you look for the registration. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email right after this webinar to everyone that's participated today. Uh, get on next week's call. It's going to be a doozy. Um, whether you join Fast Track Business or not, I'd love to see you join our, our group. We meet um, what was supposed to be every other Thursday night. Um, it, I'll give you a short rundown. So I started this group about six months ago. Uh, it's the same exact environment as the business, as the way I learned this business. Uh, in a group setting where I got to hang out and talk to and partner with and some broker notes to this group. Um, I think it's fantastic to have a group setting because I, I feel like there's camaraderie in this group. I, I feel as though we're all all for one and one for all. And that's a tremendous feeling, especially going through this crap that we're going through now. Um, I've gotten a few phone calls from people saying that they can't wait for the Thursday night call. So like I said, I started this six months ago. It was going to be every other week. We were going to take it along for a year. And then this virus hit. I said, you know what? I'm stepping this up to every, every week. We're going to have a call every week. Um, it's twice as much as what people paid for. And I don't care. Uh, I want to get everybody up to speed on sourcing product, on being part of, um, start making money as soon as possible with this group. And so I stepped up the calls to every week because I got nothing else to do anyway. And it's been fantastic. Um, great bunch of people. I think we've got 39 participants so far. Everybody is allowed to talk to everybody. Uh, there's, uh, uh, we actually have a private Facebook group that um, you can go into and do whatever you want in there. And um, so we, we're meeting every week and every week we record the session. Um, the first half of the call, people either email me in a topic that they want to talk, they want me to talk to that type, that exact um, uh, subject. Or if no one writes in, then I pick a subject and it, it may be about bankruptcy, it may be um, um, the live situation that we have going on in the world right now, uh, current events. And then the other half of the call is a Q&A of all the students asking me questions, walking them through their live deals of notes that they have of how they're dealing with bankruptcy issues because things have changed in bankruptcy now um, <laughs> because of this virus so in a good way. They're actually getting a little more technically uh, advanced in such a slow move, moving bureaucratic mess that they are. Um, so the calls are fantastic and they're recorded and added to the already created educational videos that are in the uh, learning management platform that we use. So you get, uh, we're going to have 52 calls in there, obviously, uh, over the next year, which is going to be a ton of material. Um, so, so this course is building and growing as, as we go along. And everybody gets to partner with each other if they want. They can communicate. I have no problem with people talking to each other in this private setting. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love Thursday nights. Um, I'm really getting a kick out of it because I'm seeing already the shy people sending me an email. Is it okay? Can you give me so-and-so's email address? And then I'll, I'll go to so-and-so and say, is it okay if I give you their email address? And they're like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then boom, boom. And now I'm watching these little um, side groups form, and that's exactly what I want. Um, it's, it's a great group. And uh, if you go to no conference, 
Facebook.com, get registered for, there's three different programs that we have. There's uh, the starter uh, education. I believe that's like 99 or $79 or something. Um, there's, I think, five videos included in that. It just kind of gives people a feel for how I teach and, and what I teach. And then there's two other programs as well. Uh, the Fast Track Business is the is the by far the most exclusive one. That's the one that allows you into the Thursday night calls. And um, I believe the way the pricing is structured, if you if you get the first program and then you want to go into the second program, there's no there's no uh, you, we'll just take off the the cost of the first program and add that take that away from the second program and so and so for the third program too and this is not any type of upsell or anything all this is is maybe people don't can't afford a fast track business right now but maybe they will in the future they can save up for it or something um it's all spelled out legitimately i, I the last thing i want to do is be some note guru upsell stuff and um hopefully you guys know that by now maybe you can tell maybe you can't that's fine but uh i look forward to working with you and i really appreciate you being on the call today and uh stay safe out there and we will be seeing you soon see you next week